talk about textual criticism and you relate that to the Bible, then they want to say, oh, you shouldn't be judging the Bible, you shouldn't be judging the Bible. But what is the Bible? I mean, God forbid that we fulfill Revelation chapter 22 and ever, ever take something out that should be there, put something in that shouldn't be there. But nevertheless, we're dealing with a 17th century trend. Let's use King James in here. And if you look over in 2 Timothy, we have a commandment. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and by the judgment. We're going to be judging the modern translations, not the Word of God. We can't judge the Word of God. The Word of God can't be bound. As a matter of fact, we're told that right here in the same chapter. We're not going to be judging the Word of God. But what about all of this, this profusion of modern translations that we have? And so what if you use the 1611 edition King James Version? You're still dealing with something rather modern when you've got in that 1611 edition of the Bible a book that was written almost 4,000 years ago, the book of Job. 3,600 years ago. Now, how much of what we have in Job is what Job said when Job wrote Job? That, evidently, is what a lot of people don't think of. How much of Job is really Job? Or how much of it is King James or Wycliffe or Tyndall or Jimenez or someone else along the line that maybe added something, maybe took something away? Maybe in an honest attempt to improve on perhaps a difficult passage. We'll get to that whenever we get to some of the causes for the variance in the text. But anyway, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the question being, how can you rightly divide the word of truth when you are not even for certain if you've got the word that's true? Again, we're not talking about whatever is the inspired word of God, but what is it? Now, if you've been a part of the church more than, generally we say six months, you could say probably a couple of weeks. You've been here when a change was made somewhere. Why? Upon what basis? Did we change the word of God, or, we, or did we change the King James translation of a manuscript from a manuscript from a manuscript that preserved at that time the Word of God. Now you can take it for those in ministry, you can take it for yourself. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. I mean, there are great controversies swirling around in evangelical circles about the validity of the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Amen. Especially the last verses, the last half. No problem with the first half, as long as you don't talk about tongues or serpents or divine healing. But when you get on that subject, now we've got a problem. Or is that really true? Am I being fair in what I'm saying wh where I say that that's why they've got the problem? Is that why they really got the problem? Or are there some other things that spark people's curiosity and interest about the last chapter of Mark? Which is one of the things we'll look at. I mean, we're not going to just accept things around here because we're charismatic, since it has a charismatic slant to it. Especially the last half of Mark 16. We like that. It talks about what we like to do. <laughs> Speak in tongues and pray for the sick and have signs following your ministry. But is that a good reason to believe Mark 16? Well, there we go again, basing the Word of God on our lives, our experience, instead of our experience and lives on the Word of God. And there are a lot of other passages we'll get to. So let's look at the subject of textual criticism, a definition to begin with. Probably on the other service night, it'll be another study class. We have to get through with these before we can get to some of the exposition ones, because how can you expound the passage when you don't know what the original said? How can you preach all these glory and revelation messages from a passage that perhaps is corrupt in the version and translation that you have? It's very interesting when you take the time to take the time. Textual criticism is the study of the available copies of a non-extant autograph in an attempt to determine the original text. Now, since I've revised the handful of messages we had for the text of the Bible, you'll be going by your outline 
more or less, and mm -hmm. sometimes it'll be more or less than more. <laughs> the, stu <laughs> the study of the available copies of non extent of a non extent autograph in an attempt to determine the original text. Now, does that make sense to you? You should be up with your glossary of terms on what some of these words mean. Well, the only difficult one would be autograph, and you think that you know comes from some superstar. But, well, it does from a superstar. Amen. Just a different type. That means the original manuscript. Now, some people want to make a distinction in theological circles between an original manuscript and an autograph, but I don't see any distinction, so we won't get into even explaining their erroneous views about that. The study of the available copies of any non-extant autograph I mean, if the autograph is extant, you don't need to study the copies to find out if the copies are true. Just go back to the autograph. But since we have no autographs, all of you realize that, right? We have no autographs. You know what autographs are? Glossary of terms. Go back to that if you don't. If we have no autographs, then all we can do are stu is to study the copies of the autograph. And generally, it's not the copies of the autograph. It's the copies of the copies of the copies, which makes it more difficult in an attempt to determine the original text. Now, it's an interesting profession to be in, and some people would wonder, well, how can you take something that, let's take a corrupt, perverted passage in some gospel, how can you take that and determine from that what the author originally said in that passage? Well, there are some very interesting ways that you probably never have thought of that you wouldn't think of until you do a study in textual criticism on how to know, well, what was the original word there? A passage that just comes to mind. We'll deal with more later on, but uh, one that's, that's in my mind is over in Acts chapter uh, 20, I believe. You'll find out as we go along which are the disputed passages and which are the ones that aren't disputed. I mean, this brings fear in a lot of people's hearts because they're wondering, well, am I going to get led astray or something? But this study is necessary because of our far, far removal from Bible days. I mean, if you have a letter written to you last year, you don't need to study a copy of that. Go find the original. But take a letter that was written in Abraham's day and try to find the original of it. Your only hope is to study some of the remaining copies that we have of that. But a passage in Acts 20 and verse 28 <coughs> has been in the midst of heated conversation. Now, I'm going to read through it, and you shouldn't recognize anything wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it as you see, only if you've done some independent study. Take heed, therefore, this is part of Paul's charge to the elders at Ephesus when he's back at Miletus. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the assembly of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, forgetting for a moment Holy Ghost in church, we've explained that in the past. We'll probably get into that in this class. It should be spirit and it should be the assembly of God. Putting those aside for a moment, what else do you see? Overseer, that's a fine word, fine New Testament word. There's no problem with that. Well, you're getting closer. Feed the assembly. We, we're translating it to assembly. Feed, that means spiritual food. First Peter chapter 5 teaches about that. Who purchased? Who, who, with what? What does it, what, does it say that? I don't read that here. God purchased. Okay, someone read the text. You've got to stay with what's said of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Does God have any blood? Now, Jesus does, but God the Father doesn't. And so the discussion is over the word God. Should it be God or should it be Lord? If it's Lord, 1 Corinthians 8 tells us he's talking about Jesus. If it's God, then he's talking about the Father. But the Father doesn't have any blood. 
It's an important theological passage, not just a textual criticism passage, but an important theological one as well. The Holy Spirit's made you overseers to feed the assembly of God, which he, parenthesis God, hath purchased with his, parenthesis God, own blood. So you've got God instead of the Lord, and generally in the New Testament, Lord refers to Christ and God to the Father. You've got God purchasing, he's doing the purchasing, not the Son, the assembly, and he's doing it with his own blood. The God who has no body and therefore has no blood. So that's one that comes to mind that we'll get to later. <laughs> and they're just, they're just everywhere, like about 10,000 of them. Now, we only have a few complete Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts. A lot of people don't realize this. We only have a few complete Old Testament manuscripts with the vast majority of them dating from the 10th century, and listen to this, A.D., not B.C., from the 10th century and onward. Wow. Now, again, we're separated from the original manuscript of Job by three millennia. How can we be certain that over those three millennia, every single word of the original manuscript of Job is in whatever manuscript we're finding in the 10th century A.D. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few complete Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts, the vast majority of them dating from the 10th century and onward. <clears throat> now, just to reverse, it's true with Greek manuscripts. This is all elementary, but it will come into play as we get into this more. Just to reverse, is true with the New Testament. And you see, it shouldn't be since the old came before and was written before the new, we should have older copies of the new. If the New Testament's being written in the first century A.D. and we have copies that date from the second century, then if Job was written in the 21st century B.C., we should be able to have a copy from the 20th century B.C. We don't, 3,000 years later, for most Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts. But just the reverse is true with Greek. We have 5,000 manuscripts available for the Greek New Testament, many of which date from the 4th century and onward, 4th century A.D. You see what I'm saying? How come we get earlier New Testament manuscripts when the Old Testament, in fact, was written earlier than the New? We're getting earlier New Testament ones as compared to the Old. Now, in the Old Testament, in those few manuscripts that we have, they happen to be relatively good with very few variants in them. Again, just the reverse is true with the New Testament. We've got poor quality in many of the Greek manuscripts, with a profusion of variants. A variant is simply a, uh, an error or a corruption in the text. That is when you compare two manuscripts. Let's say, for example, a 4th century A.D. manuscript of the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28, that has God, and a 5th century one that has Lord. Now, there's what you call a variant, mm -hmm. where you've got a difference between manuscripts. You can't compare them to the original. Remember that. You don't have that. But when you compare the available manuscripts, you can go through them and find five that have God and eight that have Lord. So there's a variant, and then there's a passage that has to be studied. Now, go to the verse before that. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's essentially the same in all the manuscripts, so there's no problem with that. You don't ever debate passages like that. Just the ones where you've got these variants. And so the subject of variants is what we're studying now. Now, obviously, the more copies, the reason, one of the reasons why we have more variants with the New Testament manuscripts is because we have more copies. The more copies you have, the more different people you have involved in writing it. And the more people you have, the more mistakes you have, because the error is human. Some important names in textual criticism to keep up with, B.F. Westcott, English theologian, textual critic now dead, Fenton John Anthony Hort, F.J.A. Hort, H-O-R-T, Westcott and Hort, their theory of the families of manuscripts we'll discuss later. Sir Frederick G. Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N, and Bruce M. Metzger, M-E-T-Z-G-E-R. 
just died recently, I believe. If not dead, retired. It's about the same thing. <laughs> when you retire, you're confessing you're dead or going to die shortly thereafter from 50 years at Princeton Seminary. And there are many other names, but those are probably some of the biggest names, as well as Constantine Tischendorf. I didn't get him down here, but Constantine Tischendorf, T-I-S-C-H-E-N-D-O-R-F, Tischendorf. If I spell them too fast, that's why we have tape. You'll improve on your spelling. Now, some of the tools in textual criticism are the manuscripts, abbreviated MSS period. Use those abbreviations because it'll save you writing out manuscript. Manuscript singular is MS period, plural is MSS plural period. The versions, now what's the difference between a version and a manuscript? <coughs> Although sometimes you might just use the word synonymously, they're not synonymous with one another. Okay, a version is going to be a copy in a different language. A manuscript is going to be the official language of whatever the original should have been in. So you'll have, in other words, the Septuagint is what, the Greek manuscript of the Old Testament? No, it's the Greek version. It's a Greek version because the Old Testament wasn't written in Greek but in Hebrew. The manuscripts, the versions, and the quotations, particularly from the patristic writers that you should be quite familiar with from canonicity. The manuscripts, the versions, and the quotations from the patristic writers, Augustine and Jerome and all the other ones that we've covered before. As well as you can throw in some good common sense. And you put these things together and put some common sense and some study into it, and it becomes just that, a very interesting study indeed. Now keep in mind the distinction that we're making between textual criticism with regard to the Word of God and textual criticism with regard to the translations, to the manuscript, to the quotations, the version, so forth, that we have available. How can you be textually critical of the Word of God? Well, you can't be. The Word of God is pure, the psalmist said, so you can't be a critic of it. You can't judge it. And as soon as you mention the word, people just blow up in steam. I'm talking about hyper-evangelicals that believe the King James Version's inspired. Now, when you started coming to this church, maybe you were one of those that thought, well, the Bible's inspired. And what you meant by that was my version of the Bible is inspired. And that's not true. King James Version's not inspired. It was inspired by King James, but not by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that inspired everyone, let's translate a new version. So you could say it's inspired by him, but not by the Holy Spirit. So we're not talking about judging the Word of God. We're talking about judging all of these translations and these versions, which ones are accurate, which, which ones are not. Amen. There's so many available, so many of them done in this century. Well, most of them, most of the translations done right here in this century. And you've got the modern English for this and then the super modern English for that. And it talks about things being way out and far out and cool. And the Holy Spirit didn't inspire words like that, like something's cool or far out. So, <laughs> well, that'll help win the hippie. I don't know about that. Didn't help win me. Yeah, that's the argument. That'll help win the hippies and the yippies if you talk about something being far out and cool and talk about bread when you're talking about money. I mean, say what you mean. Don't get us thinking about supper. Okay, let's go on in the variants to a couple of questions. Number one, the number of variants. And number two, the occasion which gave them their rise. Now, we've already said that there are fewer Old Testament manuscripts available, fewer complete Old Testament and New Testament, which in a roundabout way gives us fewer variants because the variants are dependent upon the number of manuscripts that you have. And if you've got 20, you've got the possibility of a whole lot of mistakes in those as compared to just two manuscripts of, let's say, one Old Testament or one New Testament book. But first of all, for the Old Testament, we've got fewer variants. 
We said a reason why is because we have fewer manuscripts. This gets a little ahead of ourselves, but um, why do you think we've got fewer manuscripts? I mean, of all of the manuscripts that are written, I mean, there are more Old Testament books than there are new. More time in which these could be copied and spread throughout the world. And yet we end up with fewer of them. And all based around Israel and Palestine, such an important part on the whole globe, an important country in the whole world. Why fewer old? Because a lot of them were destroyed. Why they were destroyed is an interesting subject that we'll get into at another time. And then another reason why we've got fewer variants is because of the rules set down for the official scribes who did the copying from one manuscript to another. We had an official class of scribes that were guided by a very strict set of rules. The rules are interesting. I've gathered, oh, about a dozen or so of them together, and there are a lot of them. And you'll find out why they were strict rules. And you get these strict rules set down by an official group of people. Uh, let me just hasten to say, you see, when you come to New Testament times, there are no such thing as New Testament scribes. The scribes were a Hebrew group of people. That was a Hebrew Jewish institution. You just have ordinary people. Now, you had professionals that could do some writing, but for the most part, you've got simply ordinary people that are going to be copying New Testament books. Right away, what does it show you when you think about these things? You're going to end up with more corruptions because you're not professionals at what they do. You've got someone who's been blessed by reading a manuscript of, of, of John's Gospel, and he wants a copy of it, so he borrows one and sits down and writes his copy from the copy that he's got. Now, you compare that against someone like O Ezra, the scribe in the Old Testament. He said, I was a ready scribe in the Law of Moses. He was good at what he, he was a professional at what he did. You think there's a difference? Just go home and write down any book in the Bible and then go back and look at it as soon as you're through and you will have mistakes. You ever type before and look back and you knew you didn't type that. The typewriter's the one who did that. <laughs> you're positive you didn't spell said, S-I-A-D, but you do it all the time though. The mind or the fingers or the typewriter, one gets crossed up. And that's with something that's supposed to be reliable. I mean, you just push a button and it's going to hopefully give you the right letter. If the keys are all right, you've got the right letter printed on the right key, it's going to give you the right letter. And you go back and look at something you've typed. And there will be mistakes in there and mistakes in there. That's why you have what they call proofreaders that work for all your publishing companies. And guess what? They're professionals. And guess what? They still miss things. Right. You'll get first, second, third editions of a book and you'll find mistakes in there. And you're kind of surprised. That's, that tells you it's a first, second, third, fourth. It's an early edition. Because as more people read it, if you're courteous in the reading public, you're supposed to write the publisher and let him know where the mistake is. That's not criticism. A lot of times they'll ask for that in the book. If you read the forward or the preface or the conclusion or something, they'll say, write us and let us know so they can get it changed whenever it goes through the press again. But this is by modern man today. And all of your newspapers and magazines and publishing companies, they all have proofreaders that work for them. And these people are supposed to be able to read well, read quickly, intelligently, go through something, find the mistakes that the author had in there, and change those, and then someone else reads it. You can't read your own because you just see yourself in there rather than seeing the mistakes. And then you pass it along to someone else, and then it goes to the printer, and they print that up, and guess what? It's got mistakes in it then. And you go through a couple of editions. Maybe you don't know this. You go through a couple of editions, and finally, after everyone's written in on those strange spellings enough, then you end up with a sixth edition that doesn't have anything wrong with it at all. Now, you see, the invention of the printing press in the 15th century was remarkable, but it's still not without its faults. Once you get it right, it'll be right forever. Once you get the plates made, they're made. It'll be right. Whereas that was never true before Gutenberg in the middle of the 15th century AD invented the printing press. Because then you just got people copying, you're always going to have these mistakes. But anyway, now that we've got uh, official scribes for the Old Testament, we don't have them for the New. We've got strict rules, guidelines set down for them, sometimes set down by them for themselves. We're going to have 
reliable Old Testament manuscripts with fewer variants. Here are some of the interesting rules. Uh, number one, the synagogue roll, there were two copies, even in the Old Testament. I think we'll get to this later. One called a synagogue roll, one called a private scroll. Even many times on the private scrolls, you would still hire a professional to do it, but the difference being it would be your copy, and it wouldn't be the official copy that belonged to the local synagogue. So there's basically the difference. A synagogue scroll, different from a private copy, could only be written on clean animal skins. This is one of the ways we know that the Old Testament originally was written on parchment as compared to the New Testament written on papyrus, which we discussed way back at the beginning of this class, the difference between parchment or vellum and papyrus. So the Old Testament manuscripts, right away, this lets us know from Jewish customs, what was it actually written on? And you remember how the scrolls were. They didn't open this way, like in Shakespearean England. They opened this way, and you'd read them from right to left. And you would have pieces, say, 11 by 11 piece, of an animal skin that had been dried, cleaned off, cured, preserved. You would put your script on that, and you'd sew that. We'll get to that, I think, the next thing. You'll sew that together with another 11 by 11 piece, and that extends and for however long you need it, 30 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet, or whatever. Uh, second rule was that these sheets I've just described 11 by 11, 10 by 10, 14 by 12, different shapes and sizes, <clears throat> but somewhere in that vicinity for all of the manuscripts. These sheets I've just described would have to be fastened together with strings from clean animals, where you would take a certain part of the animal, a part of the intestine or something, and you can get some tawny material out of the animal, or of course you could even take it from the hide something that could be preserved. And that's what's remarkable, how these things have been preserved. So the sheets would have to be fastened together with the strings from clean animals. Another one of the rules, it had to be prepared by a Jew. No Gentile was allowed to write an official synagogue scroll for the Hebrew Old Testament. Another rule, there was a set number of columns through the work. You see, the more of these guidelines you set down, then the more meticulous the scribe has to be, and he's very careful in what he does. He has a whole set of things, rather than just someone thinking this is a good book and sitting down and writing out of the book, making their copy, they're going to make many more mistakes. So a set number of columns through the work, depending on what book it was. This was true of all the books. In the fifth place, each column could not be less than 48 or more than 60 lines. So you couldn't end up with a sheet that was two feet by two feet and just write and write. First of all, it wouldn't fit in a scroll. You couldn't get it unwound. But then you'd be beyond the maximum limit of the number of lines allowed. It could not be less than 40 lines, just lines across, the writing across the, we would call page, but across a piece of parchment and not more than 60. The breadth of each line had to be 33 letters. Yeah. This was before the days of typesetting. Yeah. But the breadth of each line would have to be exactly 33 letters. Now, if you come across a book somewhere with a picture of a manuscript, you see lines that are different. That's not an official synagogue scroll. <laughs> In the seventh place, ink had to be black. Some of the later manuscripts, the Masora, or the commentary is written in them, would be in green or in red or in blue, one of the other colors. But the text had to be written in black, and it had to be prepared according to a sacred Jewish recipe. We discussed two different recipes in the early part of this class for making ink. We talked about lamp black, we talked about different things like that, which obviously there would give us the color black for the ink. The eighth place, this was supposed to be true anyway, no letter, word, or mark could be written down from memory. Why? Memory sometimes fails. So no word, letter, or mark could be written from memory. 
Another rule, there had to be a hair or a thread space, that much space between every consonant. Mm. No more, no less. You had to be able to lay down a hair between the consonants. Did they sometimes do it? You better believe they sometimes did it. They were very meticulous in what they did. That's why we've got excellent copies of the Hebrew manuscripts available. Not true with the New Testament because there aren't any New Testament scribes. Now on this one, why not a hair or thread space between the vowels? Because there are no vowels in Hebrew. There are only consonants. In the 10th place, there's so much to remember, but you see everything adds upon something else. You should have thought, well, why did he say between the consonants? Because what if you have a vowel and a consonant together? How much space between those? Well, if you're keeping up with things, you'd never think of a question like that. Only a Baptist would ask a question like that. <laughs> so much to remember, but you see everything adds upon something else. You should have thought, well, why did he say between the consonants? Because what if you have a vowel and a consonant together? How much space between those? Well, if you're keeping up with things, you'd never think of a question like that. Only a Baptist would ask a question like that. <laughs> In the tenth place, between every section, you're breaking off a paragraph or a book or something like that and starting something new. Between every section, you had to have the breadth of nine consonants. Another rule, the fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, had to terminate exactly with the end of a line. Hmm. Now, you won't find any of this in the Old Testament. God didn't say you had to do all these things, but it ended up being not a bad idea because it kept them from having the introduction of so many variants into the manuscripts. Deuteronomy had to terminate exactly with the end of a line. It couldn't go halfway and then have a period there. Another one of the regulations was that the official scribe had to be sitting in full Jewish dress. He had to have on certain clothes whenever he did the writing. That means you're not going to get up in the morning and take a shower and go sit down and copy a book. There's things you have to do before you can sit down and start copying. You've got to go on and get your, uh, your official Jewish clothes on before you can even sit down and begin to write a scroll that would be accepted in your local synagogue. You did have to shower in the 13th place. Your whole body had to be washed. You can probably begin to see the importance. You couldn't come in from a hard day of work and sit down and copy a manuscript. You had to at least take the time to get cleaned up. That would give you time to gather your thoughts and your composure and not be so exhausted. One of the very interesting requirements was in the 14th place, you could not begin to write the name of God with a pen newly dipped in ink. Why not? I shouldn't have to tell you that. Why not? You might smear his name. And what would that do? That would do just what Leviticus 19 says not to do. Don't profane the name of the Lord your God. Some of these things get on the borderline of being superstitious, but they nevertheless were effective in what they did. You could not begin to write the name of God with a pen newly dipped in ink. They didn't have ballpoint pens. We've discussed the different type of pens that they had, and whenever you dip it in there and begin to write, those letters are going to have more ink than by the time you get to the end of that sentence, obviously. You don't have the uniform type of writing, the coverage of ink that we have today. Whoever thinks of things like this? Nobody does. <laughs> Nobody thinks of things like this, except we're going to, though. There's no church like this church. Hallelujah. Then in the final place, you could take no notice of anyone who interrupted you, even a king, should he address you in your presence. The king walked up to you, the king of the whole nation, and addressed you. You could say nothing to him, not hello, not how are you, not even shalom. Why not? Well, you might make a mistake. Look up and forget where you were. Write a double sentence. Maybe you look up and you'll smear the name of God. Don't tell them what will happen. So you could look up for nothing. 
And they emphasized it by adding in this little law here, including even when a king addressed you. You simply could not look up for anything. So that means you are concentrating fully. How many times are you really concentrating like that? When you're writing something, not all the time. Sometimes you're doing something else while you're writing or typing. And that's why it ends up like it ends up. Don't blame the typewriter like I am used to do. Okay, moving on to the New Testament. That's for the Old Testament. We said that fewer variants of the Old Testament because fewer manuscripts, those manuscripts are fewer because they were destroyed and because of the strict set of rules set down for the official class of scribes when they're going about to make a synagogue scroll or roll. We said fewer Old Testament manuscripts. We said most of them that are um, complete date from the 10th century onward. Greek, they go all the way back to the 2nd century. Full manuscripts back to the 4th century. 5,000 of them. What about the variants? Obviously more. Here's some of these statistics. In 1707, the critic John Mill with the manuscripts that were available to him, estimated that there were 30,000 variants in the New Testament. 30,000 variants in the New Testament. A century and a half later, 1874, F.H.A. Scrivener obviously with more manuscripts by this time, estimated from his calculations that there were 150,000 variations, variants, as we call them in the New Testament. Smaller book, but more variants. Today, that leaves us with 200,000 variants in the New Testament. You say, which manuscript? Well, you see, that's when you put all of them together and take a verse, Acts 20 and verse 1, and find out. Now, does anyone disagree with the way this verse is mm -hmm. in this manuscript? Does anyone disagree with this? Is it always going to be the same? 200,000. I mean, how can you really read your New Testament and be confident in what you're reading after tonight? When you know there are 200,000 variants in the New Testament. Now, how many of those got over in the New Testament as being a corrupt text? That is, in our King James Version. How many of them, when you found four variants, there were four different ways to do something, like Mark 16, did the correct one out of those four get picked and placed in the authorized version, the King James Version? How many of those did? How many of them didn't? One comforting thing about the number of variants, 200,000, is that it only represents 10,000 different places in the New Testament. In other words, if you've got this verse here in Acts 20 and verse 28, and you've got some manuscripts that read God and some that read Lord, then that's two variants right there. You count that as two. And if you have another one that read Lord God and another one that read Christ, another one that read Father, well, there's five variants there. In other words, it helps, although we've got a lot of variants, 200,000, to have them in fewer places than 200,000 places, namely 10,000 places, so that all the other verses aren't any problem at all. You see, if we had 200,000 variants in 200,000 places, well, that'd probably take up the whole New Testament and then some. But we only have 200,000, or we have 200,000, but the word only should go before we only have 10,000 places where these 200,000 variants occur which still means that you're not going to look them all up and correct them overnight. That's why people like uh, Tischendorf. Tischendorf, when, when he was born, from what I can remember, spent his whole life in textual criticism and still wasn't satisfied when he died. <laughs> that he had gotten everything corrected so that, that he felt comfortable in what he read that it was reliable. And he wasn't only a textual critic, he was a purchase, purchaser of manuscripts. He was a discoverer. He was an archaeologist. He just did it all. I mean, today you've got all the specialties, and someone goes and finds it, and some rich person buys it, and then he donates it to some university, and you're a professor at that university, and you get the benefit of studying it then. And Tischendorf wasn't like that back in the middle of the 1800s. He went and did it all himself. 
he's the one who made one of the most fantastic discoveries in the last couple of centuries concerning manuscripts when he discovered the manuscript Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, that discusses the variance, that, the number. That lets you know what we're up against. We're not up against something small here. We're not up against just Mark 16. Generally, people will pick one or two and argue about that. We're talking about 10,000 different places in the New Testament with 200,000 variants. And that doesn't count the variants in the Old. And year by year, the number increases because more manuscripts either are discovered or many times that's not the case, are published. So many of them, even the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're not all published. And they were discovered three decades ago, three and a half decades ago. And we still don't know all of the material there. It takes time for them to be discovered, for them to be like the Copper Scroll that was discovered in the third cave, I believe, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, at least three years for it to be unwound. It was so deteriorated and had joined itself together and then someone has to read it, and someone has to write it, and someone has to be funded by a publisher or a rich friend somewhere to get it published before it gets out into the public. And then we'll find out, well, now here's another manuscript. Do we have any additional variants beside those 200,000 that we already have? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always yes. We've always got at least a couple more new ones. So as the years go by, the variants increase. Let's turn now to the subject of how the variants arose. There were two major groups of typ typical errors by the scribes who were doing the copying or by just the average person who was doing <coughs> some copying. There's the unintentional group of errors where an error is made in the text, a corruption is placed in the text or something taken out of the text unintentionally, and then there's the intentional section. Now here's where it gets interesting, so you, it, it'll give you some, some ideas on exactly how, uh, whenever we sit down and compare uh, a couple of variants in two different manuscripts, how we go about choosing one over the other. What makes you choose one over the other? Just because in Acts 20, 28, it says that God has blood, is that automatically enough to make you change the name of God to Lord? I mean, is it or is it not? It, you, you have to answer the question yourself. Probably now you don't know enough to answer the question. Is that enough to, to go in there to that text now and change the word to Lord, or not really change it, but just accept the Lord variant as compared to the God variant? Because God doesn't have blood. Or is Jesus God? Is he God or is he not God? Amen. If he's God and he had blood, then that could have been him. But why God? Why not Lord? Unintentional, we'll look at first. Now here's where the scribe either misreads, miswrites, mishears, or to keep the continuity going, misjudges or misthinks. These are five separate errors, areas of unintentional errors. The copyist misreads, miswrites, mishears, misjudges, or misthinks about something. And we'll take them in that order. The broadest section being the first one because this is generally where the mistakes came in if they were unintentionally done. The scribe or the copyist would simply misread his exemplar. Now, I don't know if that's on your glossary of terms, but the exemplar is the copy that he's using to take his copy from. His ends up being the copy, and the one he's looking at taking his copy from is known as the exemplar. I might not have even placed that on your glossary. But that's what an exemplar is. Don't confuse it now with autograph. They're two different things. So generally the mistake would be in the area of misreading what his exemplar said. All right, we're going to look at several different areas, about a half a dozen different areas under this subject of misreading. Unintentionally, unintentionally now. Remember, he's not trying to slip in a pet doctrine or something. He unintentionally misreads. How do you know that he, if you weren't there beside him, how do you know that he unintentionally misread? Mm -hmm. 
How do you know he didn't do it on purpose? How do you know he really misread and it was unintentional? Well, here are some of the things to keep in mind. Number one, one type of misreading error would be a confusion of similar letters. If you'll turn over to the book of Psalms. We'll look at some examples under some of these and others are obvious. It would just be redundant. Psalm 119. A confusion of similar letters were under unintentional errors where the copyist or the scribe is misreading something. Psalm 119. Now we're using this because we have our Hebrew alphabet here. Let's look at a couple of the letters. Whenever I give you a verse, it'll be the letter that begins that section. Verse 9, take verse 9 and verse 81. Now you've got to get the two letters close to each other and look at that. Now, if you're writing something real fast, do you think you can make a distinction between verse 9 and verse 81? You see what I'm talking about, the letter before that, the letter that stands in front of the word, which is the name of it. Look at those two letters. They're almost identically the same. Amen. And if you're sitting down reading something and you read these, these two letters here, they look pretty close. If you're tired at all, you may miss that and put the wrong letter in. Uh, verse 25 verse 153. Hebrew is peculiar in this area because so many are so similar. Verse 25, verse 153. Okay, again, they're very similar. It would be easy to misread that. If that's stuck in a 14-foot long word, it'd be easy to misread that letter. Verse 33, verse 57. 33 and 57. <laughs> Just amazing how many of them are so similar. Some of you are looking around. Are you finding what I'm talking about? Some Bibles don't have it. Some Bibles don't have it. That means yours costs under $1.95. <laughs> Okay, verse 41, verse 73. You should have got Bibles like mine, then I can tell you what page you're all on. <laughs> I'll do that later on because I remember I've got that down. So those of you that will be blessed will be blessed. Verse 41. <laughs> There's someone who has one. And 73, not as similar as the others, but... If you're lazy and don't continue the mark on 41, it'll look like 73. Uh, then a final example, verse 121 and 137. Those are very similar again. So here's something that is a surprise if you don't know it before, that it's easy to confuse letters that are similar. It's very easy to confuse them whenever you're reading what your exemplar says. Now, you see, a way to correct this is what if when you substitute that letter in there, it spells a word that doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. Then you know right away that's the wrong letter in there. You see, there's, there's our first clue. I mean, the light should be coming on. Now, there's your first way to find out how you can objectively find which variant is right and which variant is wrong. Now, that doesn't always work. Because what if you put a letter in there that does make sense, such as you pluralize the word? Both of them make sense then. Then which word are you going to pick? Well, then you have to go to some other test. But here's a good one. You can put a letter in there, and the word doesn't even spell a word now. So you know that's the wrong letter. You go take that letter out and put the other letter in, and you've got the correct word. If you look over in 1 Kings, Hebrew letters in Old Testament days were also used to write numbers. They didn't have one, two, threes. They had letters, and a certain letter of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet would stand for a certain number. And these also, again, were very easy to confuse, just like you've seen in these letters. And I'll give you a couple of examples where this has been the identical thing that has taken place. 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 26 with 2 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 25. Here we're going to have one of these places where we've got the substitution 
of a wrong letter. 1 Kings 4.26, And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now, as you're reading along, if you're thinking about the passage, then knowing Solomon, that he always had extra of everything, he could afford extra of everything, he always had duplicates, he always had a certain number of laborers that come in and work for three months, and then they'd go away, and then another group would come in and work. Why, or we sh should say how, can you have 40,000 stalls of horses, let's say one horse per stall, 40,000 horses, and only 12,000 men to ride them. Now that doesn't fit. And if you say, well, you put two horses to a chariot and one man to a chariot, that still doesn't fit. You need 20,000 men. All you've got is 12. Besides that, many times the chariots were carried about only by one horse and not two. And besides that, many times the chariots had two men in them and not one. One to drive, one to use the bow and the arrow. So if anything, I'm saying you ought to have more men than horses because the men would be taking vacations and someone else would take their place on the horse. You've got 40,000 horses and 12,000 men. Now you've got numbers, in other words. We're involving numbers here. Go over to the other passage. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now that's a lot better. You've got more horsemen, three times the number then you have horses, and that fits better. Well, what do we have? We've got an error in the text over in 1 Kings 4 and verse 26. Now, that wasn't just King James that stuck a 40 in there instead of 4. That's because that's what one of the variants read. And a comparison should have been made with verse 25 of first, uh, 2 Chronicles 9. You can't put both of them in there. You see, that's where we've got inconsistencies in our version. You can't have both of them. He either had 4 or 40. Stay with one of them. One or the other, not both of them. And you shouldn't pick 40 because that's wrong. You have to stick with uh, the Second Chronicles passage of 4,000 stalls for horses, 12,000 men. Now, just the reverse is true. Second Chronicles 22 and verse 2 compared with Second Kings 8.26. Without turning here, I believe the story is about one of the kings. And in one passage, he's 42. In the Second Chronicles passage, he's 42, and in the other passage, he's 22. And so when you start comparing all of the dates and how long this king reigned, you find out that he couldn't be 42. He had to be 22. So you change the 42 passage, which I believe is the one in Second Chronicles, to read 22, like Second Kings 8 and verse 26. Okay, that's a confusion of similar letters. The second place under misreading you could have what they call the transposition of letters. Here you transpose two letters, but the word still makes sense. Now, if you transpose the letters like I gave you the example earlier, said, S-A-I-D, to S-I-A-D, you just wrote something down wrong. It's not that you're reading something wrong. You just wrote something down wrong, and that we'll get into whenever we get to what uh, the scribes would miswrite. But when you transpose the letters, like in the word files, F-I-L-E-S, and flies, F-L-I-E-S, you've got the identical same word, except the I and the L are switched. You see, files, F-I-L-E-S, and flies, F-L-I-E-S, the same word. And you could easily look down and see files, and when you wrote it, or when, you, when you're looking down, you thought you saw flies. You switched the I and the L in your mind as you were looking down. Now, in that case, probably the sentence is going to let you know that flies doesn't make sense and therefore files should be. But what if it does make sense? See, then you've got a problem on your hands, and that's how all these variants are coming about. So that's transposition of letters. It's happened many, many times. But we, without giving you the Greek and Hebrew, we couldn't give you this. Okay, in the third place, what's known as hoplography. Here you have two identical letters are groups of letters or words that occur together in a sentence and one of these is omitted. The English sentence that we could use has a double had. We had had something done unto us. 
When you look down, those two words had are identical, and they come right together. When, you're, when you look down and read, sometimes you think you see only one had because they both come together. There's hoplography. You've got letters, you've got the end of words, you've got words themselves that are identical or very close to one another, and as a result, you leave one of them out. You saw a double had, or you thought you saw a single had when in fact it was a double had down. Again, knowing these things will help you make the corrections that are necessary. Then next, ditography <coughs> is just the opposite of that. It's the reverse order, in other words, of hoplography. You repeat letters or words which really don't exist. You didn't have a had had in the sentence, we had had our meals for the day. All you had was we had our meal for the day. And instead, you misread it and saw a double had. And so ditography is just the opposite of hoplography in the reverse order where instead of subtracting or omitting something under hoplography, you're adding something under ditography. Another interesting case with a long name is Hamoyote Luton. That will be on your glossary of terms. Hamoyote Luton, where you've got the end of one word that looks like the end of another word in the same sentence. And when you look down at that, you leave out all the material that came between those two words because you confuse those two words to be the same word and therefore you leave all the material out. Now that's a little difficult, but I've got an example that I believe is in Codex Vaticanus over in John chapter 17. Very interesting example. Because of the way they've made a mistake, you can tell obviously that a mistake has arisen. John chapter 17, verse 15. Now you have to look at this verse carefully. Now here we've got a very famous case of homoio telutin. You've got a word that looks the same, or a group of words in this case, that are the same as the group of words later on in the same sentence. And when you look down at it, your mind just blanks out on all the material that came before. Now, what are the words that are sa the same? I pray not that thou shouldest. I'll have to spell it out for you so you can see it. That thou shouldest. Take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest. Keep them from the evil one. Now you see there are two places where those three words occur, that thou shouldest. So what happened? You look down and you see that thou shouldest in the very beginning, and you see it later on, and you confuse that as being the same place, that thou shouldest, and so you skip the material between. Now read the sentence and see what you end up with. I pray not that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. He's praying that God lets the devil get us. You know, he's praying, he said, I'm not praying that you protect them. I'm praying that you don't protect them. Well, obviously, that's doctrinally wrong. So we know what is taking place here is the air called homoia to Luton. You understand that? You're skipping over that material in between. And all you see is, I pray not that thou shouldest, you skip over, take them out of the world, but you pick up with that thou shouldest, you keep on going, I pray not that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. So there's an example of homoio telutin. Okay, in the sixth place, under misreading, we have the air of joining words together when they shouldn't be joined. And in the seventh place, just the reverse, airs of dividing words when they shouldn't be divided. The classic English example is the word together. You can divide that word to make it say, to get her, go to get her, or go together, and make it all one word, depending on what you do. What did the exemplar say, together, or was it divided to get her? And then you either divide it or didn't divide it. And that happens many times. It's the same with the old story that's told generally under this example for the infidel father that had a plaque over his mantle that read, God is nowhere. And he asked his daughter one time, who had been to a Christian school, mm -hmm. to read it, and she said, God is now here. Just depends on how you divide the words. You end up with entirely different meaning. 
He meant it to, be, to mean God is nowhere. She said, I read that to mean God is now here. Spelling difference? No. The same spelling. It's a, an air of either dividing or separating words or letters in a word. You've got letters in your, that make up a word, and you separate them, and you end up with other words from it, like we've done with together. Okay, those cover some of the misreading. We're getting out of time, so one other case would be miswriting. Miswriting, you've got the exact same type of errors under misreading, but one is in what you see and one is in what you write. The same type of errors. Did you think you saw in there, had, had, then that's misreading. Did you really only see had, but when you went to put it down in writing, you wrote had, had, then that's miswriting. So the same type of error, but one of them is in what you see and one of them is in what you write.